So why are oil and gas so important to the United States? Well, the first reason is that the United States consumes a lot of oil. So what the green circles are showing you here is how much oil is consumed in different countries around the world. This is from 2016, but you can see that the United States is by far the world's number one consumer of oil, closely followed by China. Now, that's for several reasons. One is just that economies that are wealthier consume more oil because, as we said, oil is the lifeblood of the economy. It is what makes the economy go. Typically, uh, recessions are triggered because oil costs rise, which increases the cost of doing everything in the economy. And so the economy slows down. So as goes oil, so goes the economy and vice versa. And so the United States as the world's largest economy uses more oil than other places. It also has more industry and manufacturing than other wealthy places like in Europe. And it is also uses a lot of vehicles for transport and a lot of long distances involved in transport. And so that's why the U.S. is the world's number one oil consumer. Okay. Now, the second big reason is that the United States is the world's number one producer of oil. And for many years, it was the world's dominant producer. So this chart only goes back to just after World War II, 1950. But what you need to know is for the first half century of the oil industry from 1901 to after World War II, the United States, and you can see this at the start of the chart, was the world's dominant producer by far. So there were times when the U.S. was producing about 70 percent of global oil. And so that's why when the United States placed an embargo on the empire of Japan, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the U.S. was forced into the Second World War. And that's why once it entered, most people assumed that the Allies were going to win because the United States industrial might, i.e. its oil reserves, came in on the side of the Allies. Now, what I want you to also see from this chart is how much things changed in the 60s and 70s, where other sources of oil, like the USSR, like Saudi Arabia, like Iran, rose to prominence, eventually surpassed the United States in oil production. And then I want you to see, just at the end, the United States becomes, again, the world's number one producer of oil, but it's certainly nothing like as dominant as it was after World War II, and in fact, no country will ever again achieve that kind of dominance in oil because oil is produced in a diverse array of countries around the world. Now, so uh, let's look at that a little bit further. Where is oil produced around the world? Well, I think what's helpful to understand is there's really a top tier of three producers, which is Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Russia. Each of these producers typically produce over 10 million barrels per day of oil. So here in August 2022, barrel of oil is worth about $90. And so that means that each of these, uh, each of these countries is producing um, about a billion dollars a day in oil. Oil. So just a huge amount of oil from these three producers. Now, what we'll see is now the United States is the number one producer, but Russia and Saudi Arabia at times uh, can go back and forth and have over the last uh, 30 years. There's a second tier of oil producers that is typically includes countries like China, like Canada, like the UAE and Iraq. Um, and then there's a third tier of oil producers, including countries like Nigeria and Norway. And so you can see that all on this sort of snapshot of production in different countries. But uh, now let's look at just those top three producers, the United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, US in blue, Russia in orange, Saudi Arabia in red. What this chart is showing is both production of petroleum in the dark bars and production of natural gas in the light bars. And what this will show you is how fracturing, which really took off in the United States after 2008, made the United States the number one producer of petroleum and natural gas by far. If you go back 
to 2008, you can see that at that time, Saudi Arabia was the number one producer of oil and Russia was the number one producer of natural gas. But as time progresses and you go forward, you can see that the U.S. becomes the world's number one producer of petroleum and a number one producer of natural gas by far. And now sort of the unrivaled energy superpower in the world. Now, for those of you who prefer moving pictures, here is an animation that shows the United States dominance in the world before World War II in oil production. But in green, you can see the USSR, and in yellow, those Middle Eastern countries sort of catching up with the United States. And in the 1970s, they actually surpassed the United States in oil production. The USSR falls back with the fall of the Soviet Union. Saudi Arabia becomes number one for a while. Russia moves uh, back to number one. And then just in 2018, the United States becomes again the world's largest producer of oil. So that, as we discussed, is because of fracturing, of hydraulic fracturing, directional drilling, and hydraulic fracturing. Now, I've given you other videos to look at to see that process, but what I want you to look at here is a static, uh, a static diagram that shows basically what fracturing does. Now, first, if you have a conventional production of oil and gas, that's typically happened. Oil and gas was created uh, over many, many years when organic matter uh, was compressed under heavy rock layers, under high heat and high pressure that turned it into that mix of molecules, hydrocarbons that forms oil and gas. And those uh, oil and gas molecules are lighter than the, you know, surrounding, uh, the surrounding earth. And so they want to rise toward the surface. Now, if they are created in a permeable rock, they can go ahead and flow upwards and they will continue to flow upwards until they hit an impermeable rock. And so they'll be trapped against that in a kind of a reservoir or trap where oil and gas can just sit there until you produce them by drilling down into it. So, you know, if you have ever seen a video of the Beverly Hillbillies, they shoot the ground and oil pops up. Well, that's that idea that basically oil is trapped near the surface. And if you can just drill through that impermeable rock, it's going to come right uh, to the surface. Now, fracturing has unlocked a different source of oil and gas, which is that, imagine, remember I said that that oil and gas could migrate towards the surface if it was created in layers of permeable rock, rock that oil and gas could flow through. But there's a lot of oil and gas that was created under intense heat and pressure in just a rock strata where it couldn't flow. And the oil and gas has been permanently trapped in tiny pores in that rock. And we have known for decades that if you could bring that rock to the surface and crush it up, you could extract that oil and gas from it. But that's just not economically feasible because a lot of those rock layers are trapped more than a mile beneath the surface of the earth. So there's no way to get that all to the surface and make money breaking it up and getting the oil and gas out of it. The fracturing revolution, the fracking revolution happens because people figured out how to crack up that rock in the earth. And the way to do it is what you see in this diagram, which is that you drill often more than a mile beneath the earth to a kickoff point where you start going sideways and you then thread that rock layer that has oil and gas trapped in tiny pores in it. And so you drill maybe another mile or further uh, horizontally. At that point, you send down explosive charges. Those explosive charges put cracks in that rock that start to open up those pores so oil and gas can flow back. But to crack them open more and extract more of the oil and gas, you send down water under very, very high pressure to extend those cracks and release more oil and gas. And then you, in that water is mixed sand so those cracks can't close back up. And so then once you've cracked open the rock to release all that oil and gas and held those cracks open with that sand, the oil and gas is free to flow back up to the surface and to pro and can be uh, produced. And so that's where our new oil and gas from fracking comes from. Now you can see this diagram is also showing you some of the environmental concerns that are raised by 
fracturing. So, you know, one common concern is about the water table. Now, the oil and gas is typically produced far, far below the water table, but you have to drill through the water table to get to it. And there are a lot of uh, requirements that oil and gas companies follow to protect the water table when they drill through it. But there is always some chance that either something goes wrong or something is done wrong in that process. And so the more holes you drill, the more chance that there might be some communication, some oil and gas that could get into that water table or other uh, other chemicals or uh, fracturing fluid, etc. Now, the EPA has studied this issue and it said this isn't a widespread problem, but it does sometimes happen. And keep in mind that when we have these big oil booms as we've had in the United States, making us the number one producer again, that means drilling a lot of wells and something always may go wrong. Now the fracturing is done. You have, you know, you have to pump water at very high pressure. Typically, there's a lot of uh, diesel uh, vehicles involved, and so there can be some local air pollution as a result of that. And then the other thing that can happen is that you have all that water that you've used to fracture, as well as maybe water that was produced. From, uh, from that rock and you have to do something with that. You can't dump it in streams or lakes or marshes. That's all forbidden by the Clean Water Act. And so typically that is injected deep in the ground. And that's what we do with a lot of uh, potentially contaminating um, uh, contaminating gases, liquids, etc. And you have to find a place where doing that uh, it's safe, it's not gonna damage water supplies, etc. But a one challenge is one thing we found is in places, particularly in Oklahoma and North Texas, um, where we are disposing of more of that wastewater, we've seen increasing earthquakes. Now, why is that? It's actually very challenging to say. It's often very difficult to predict if we're going to have an earthquake, if we happen to discharge water one place or the other. Uh, typically, uh, you know, one thought is that well, maybe we're just discharging a lot more water and that's lubricating um, some of the fault lines that have been there under the earth for millennia, but now are slipping. And so as a result, you get an earthquake and that might be made worse by some of the uh, additives that they put in fracking fluid that are designed to uh, lubricate oil and gas, make it easier to flow out of the pores where it is kept. And so that is one possible uh, reason that we're seeing those earthquakes. But that's an area that continues, um, continues to be studied and is particularly important uh, in North Texas and where I am and, and in Oklahoma, uh, there's much less of that in some other places where there's a lot of fracturing as we'll talk about like North Dakota, uh, Pennsylvania, et cetera. So I will use this term fracking and I just want you to be aware that some people don't like the term fracking. In fact, there are folks in the industry who say that it's a bad term you shouldn't use. I don't know if any of you are fans of Battlestar Galactica, but there it's kind of a substitute word for a swear word. And of course, at a minimum, the, you know, the protest signs write themselves. Don't frack our planet, etc. And so a couple of years ago, there was a move by some of the sort of public relations people uh, in the industry to say, the word has become a slur, shouldn't be used by media outlets that are trying to be objective. And in fact, um, the vice president for strategic affairs, sort of public relations, maybe govern government affairs at Chesapeake Energy Gas Company said, this is a co-opted word and a co-opted spelling used to make it look as offensive as people can try to make it look. The idea is fracking is a misnomer because really this is a whole suite of techniques. It is directional drilling and hydraulic fracturing, et cetera. And fracking is a shorthand that, you know, basically makes it seem like, a, you know, an ugly, dirty, you know, non-gentle uh, process. And so the, uh, and so people shouldn't use the word fracking. Well, the reason that I use the word fracking is because it's also used in the energy industry all the time. And in fact, here's an example of the exact same company, Chesapeake Energy, using uh, that word. So their PR people are saying, oh, don't use that word. It makes it sound you know, dirty or bad. Um, and at the same time, a couple of years later, they're saying that they have, you know, their fracking has now reached the stage of propagandan. It's called Propent is the sand molecule that's used to uh, frack. In fact, they call it the era of the monster frack. 
So one side of the company saying, don't use the word fracking. The otherwise one saying, hey, we're doing monster fracking. Um, and so you can see how it's used in the industry. Here's a little bit from that article. Uh, it says the era of the monster frack has arrived in North America and Chesapeake Energy is singing its praises. Chesapeake said Thursday at a conference that it set a record for fracking by pumping more than 25,000 tons of sand down one Louisiana natural gas well, a process that shale driller christened Propageddon. What we're doing is unleashing hell on every gas molecule downhole. I think it's probably a gladiator quote, you know, on my signal, unleash hell. But, uh, and that's by the vice president of operations for Chesapeake just a couple of years later. So if somebody doesn't want you to use the word fracking, well, don't use it. But it is a word that's commonly used in the industry and I'll continue to use it just because it's a convenient shorthand. We all understand this actually refers to a whole suite of techniques, including that directional drilling, threading the rock and the fracturing that, uh, um, that releases those oil and gas molecules. Now, where does fracturing happen? Well, this is showing plays, which are just places that uh, money is invested in producing oil and gas around the country. And what you can see here is an orange is gas plays where, uh, where the fracturing is producing natural gas and in blue oil plays where fracturing is producing oil. The biggest gas play by far is in the east and you can see that in orange here covering Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and even a little bit of Ohio, the Marcellus, where they're producing natural gas. And then in terms of oil, you can see some is produced here in the Bakken, mostly in North Dakota on the border with Canada. Um, and then you see the Eagle Ford south of uh, Austin and San Antonio. And then there's a whole group of different uh, a different reservoirs of different formations that are in the Permian Basin, which is mostly in West Texas, but extends into New Mexico. And this is actually the biggest oil producing field in the world now. So that is where more oil is being produced than anywhere. It's important to note that those places that are producing oil, that those little pores in the rock that hold that oil that's fractured typically hold natural gas as well. So they're in those places that's called an oil play, that's because you know really the economics of drilling there is mostly driven by production, production of oil and the money you get for the oil. But you also are getting money um, for the natural gas as well, at least in some instances. And so we've seen natural gas production increase in those places as well. Here's a little zoom in on Texas, which as we'll see is the number one producer of both oil and natural gas. You can see um, the Eagle Ford in the south, south of Austin and San Antonio. You can see the uh, Permian Basin out west. And it's also worth looking at the Barnett Shale, which is uh, right you know, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The reason that's important, although there's not a lot of drilling there now, it is one of the areas where fracturing was really uh, developed. The technology uh, proved effective, et cetera. The Haynesville uh, play on the border of Texas and Louisiana also may be important in the future uh, just because it is considered one of the cleanest sources of natural gas. And so to the extent that Europe is demanding cleaner sources of natural gas that leads to less emissions um, in the oil fields, then some of some places in Europe are looking for oils, particularly uh, from Haynesville. So uh, if we look at crude oil production in the United States, what you can see is more and more is coming from uh, places that are fractured. So sometimes we call that tight oil because the oil is stuck in those little pores. Sometimes uh, we would call that shale oil, oil from shale. But you can see that, you know, if you go back to 2008, very little oil was being produced from these colored uh, shale plays that you can see on the right. But then as you move on to uh, the current day, most U.S. oil is coming from shale and certainly most new sources of oil. You can see those important sources of oil like the Bakken in North Dakota, like the Eagle Ford south of uh, San Antonio and Austin. And uh, again, the Permian in both Texas and New Mexico, you see all these Permian sources being very important sources of oil. Now, if we break that down by state, we see that Texas is by far the United States leading producer 
of oil and that with the fracking revolution starting especially in 2010 you see a massive run up in oil production in Texas in these years and then another one uh, from 2017 to 2019 getting Texas to where it currently sits at about 5 million barrels per day of production. Now again, right now we're talking about 90, uh, $90 a barrel oil. So we're talking about a, basically a half billion dollars in production every day in Texas. And so I think sometimes there's this kind of misunderstanding that, oh, Texas has always been an oil state. Well, if it was an oil state back in 2010, it is five times as much of an oil state now. This is a truly massive run up in production. In fact, if you look at this increase, especially in 2018, 2019, that is the biggest commodity boom that has ever happened in the history of the world. So you've heard about, you've read novels, you've watched movies, you've heard stories about these you know, gold rushes and oil rushes in the past, right? They sort of the romance of this production this massive production, these boom towns, etc. Well, those are all just dwarfed by what happened in Texas in recent years. In fact, this run up in both Texas and the United States in 2018 was was an order of magnitude bigger than any previous commodity boom in the United States and seven times bigger than the biggest one in the world previously, which was oil in Saudi Arabia in the 1970s. OK. Now, you can also see other places where oil production is increasing. You see that it's increased in New Mexico, and New Mexico is now the number two producer of oil. You also see in light blue here that offshore production in the U.S. remains very important, federal offshore production. You can see that North Dakota and its Bakken formation um, really in the fracking revolution has moved to be an important number two producer of oil. And then you can see that kind of um, third tier of producers, Alaska, Colorado, Oklahoma, California, very important. Now, you probably also want to think about this chart when you think about where should I be most interested in the oil and gas law of what state? And clearly, the one you want to be most concerned about is Texas, but it's also going to be very important, New Mexico, North Dakota. You might imagine that there's important decisions in some of these that have been, you know, big producers for a long time, Oklahoma, Colorado, etc. cetera. So, um, so you can think about that when we're thinking about, you know, which, which sources should I really look at? Uh, in my particular course at SMU, I typically ask people to only know the law of Texas, although it's really helpful to understand the examples of different rules that there are in different states because those can be useful comparisons. I think if you're gonna pick just one comparison, often Oklahoma is a really good comparison because it often has different rules in ways that are useful and helpful to understanding, uh, to understanding the law. Okay. Now, this chart basically just stacks what you saw from the other charts and looks at that production. You can see that big uh, run up in production that is associated with the fracking revolution that leads to a huge increase in U.S. production and brings it to the number one producer in the world. Uh, producing a billion dollars in oil every day. Now, I want you to also notice, and you may have noticed this on the previous one, this big fall in oil production that happens in early 2020. And of course, that is the impact of the pandemic and the concern, are people even gonna use oil anymore? How much are we gonna be locked down by this pandemic? There's another big fall that happens in early 2021. What's that? That's winter storm Uri. So one thing you know that you will learn about if you take energy law with me, et cetera, is how the energy system is increasingly interconnected. And so if electricity goes out, that has uh, knock on effects that can take down parts of the oil and gas system, which is particularly a problem because as we talked about, natural gas is a crucial input for electricity in our system. And really, increasingly, this sole reliable source of electricity um, that uh, we're relying on in Texas and the United States and around the world. So if uh, the electricity outage takes down oil and natural gas production, that's a huge problem, a very interesting problem in energy law. Now, if we look at natural gas production, you see the same story that you saw before, which is that uh, increasingly natural gas production comes from these, uh, these shale plays, these shale, it's shale production of 
natural gas as opposed to conventional, which you see here in gray. And you see a lot of it comes from the Marcellus. But another thing that you can see, which is kind of interesting, is that uh, there's a lot of production from places like the Permian and the Eagle Ford and the Bakken that you think of as oil plays. But that's remember, as I said, when you produce oil in those places, there's a, often a lot of natural gas with it. And in fact, one difference between fracturing and conventional production is in conventional production, remember that oil and gas bubbled up and caught against a cap rock. And that usually means it's in a permeable reservoir where basically the natural gas can go to the top and the oil can settle to the middle with water at the bottom. And that means you can often target. I want to produce just the oil or just the natural gas. But with fracturing, you have the oil and gas molecules stuck together in tiny pores in the rock. And so when you crack up that rock, you get everything together, including both oil and natural gas. And so uh, that can be great if you can sell both that oil and natural gas. But one problem that we'll talk about later in the course is that sometimes you can sell the oil, but you don't have infrastructure yet to sell the natural gas. And what do you do at that point? That can create both environmental and economic problems. Now, if I look at natural gas production by state, uh, what we can see here is that Texas, again, is number one, but the fracking revolution has made Pennsylvania a clear number two. And there's some of the you know, important historical producers like Oklahoma, like Wyoming, that have been um, surpassed. You see Louisiana is now the number three producer. Um, you can see there's more kind of seasonal variation in natural gas because sometimes you wait to produce natural gas until it's needed if you need more of it uh, in the winter for heating, etc. cetera. Um, so you can see it's kind of a squigglier line. But the important thing to see here is that Texas, again, number one producer, the most important state to be concerned with. But again, Oklahoma, which I said is a good contrast, a good way to pay attention, one to pay attention to, and Pennsylvania because it's now such an important natural gas producer. Now, last slide for this lesson is stacking those graphs again and looking at U.S. natural gas production. And you can see that over time, U.S. natural gas production has ramped up with the addition of basically Pennsylvania coming on the scene as well as West Virginia to some extent, which remember, West Virginia is also part of that uh, Marcellus shale. Um, and you can see U.S. natural gas production rising over time. So with that, we'll end the lesson and I'll look forward to seeing you next time.